Chris, this is Dana. I don't know why, but I'm coming through under the web conferencing other than I must have, have I don't know if my computer is linking to that because I'm doing so many uh, if, conferences. So just FYI, I'm a host too. If you need John, we're ready for, uh, to go live. Okay. Thanks, Michelle. Thanks, Chris. I would like to call this October 26, 2020 special meeting of the Whitefish City Council to order. Thank you, everyone, for joining us this evening remotely. We know it's challenging, but we certainly appreciate your uh, efforts to, to join us and um, participate publicly through this process. Uh, this evening, we have a relatively short agenda. Uh, we're going to go ahead and start with the Pledge of Allegiance, and if I could ask uh, Bridger, would you mind uh, leading us this evening in our Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, and justice for all. Thank you, Bridger. I appreciate that. Michelle, before... I call our first and only item on the agenda. Will you please take a roll call of both the council members as well as staff directors present, please? Sure. Uh, Councillor Davis? Present. Councillor Sweeney? Present. Councillor Hennon? Councillor Hennon? Uh, Councillor Quinnell? Here. Councillor Norton? Here. Councillor Fury? Uh, here. I do see Councillor Hennon, so he is here. And then we'll move to staff. Uh, City Manager Smith? Here. City Attorney Jacobs? Here. And... Uh, Chief Dial and Assistant Chief Kelch? Yeah. Here. Here. I think I see Ben Dolman here too. Uh, Finance Director Dolman. Yeah. I think that's it. Thanks very much, Michelle. Um, I will go ahead and call our first and only public hearing 
this evening, which will be the purpose of our meeting tonight. And that is item 2A of the agenda, which is ordinance 20-16, an emergency ordinance of the city council of the city of Whitefish, Montana, enacting restrictions upon gatherings and businesses to help reduce the spread of COVID-19. And this would waive a second reading and go into effect immediately with two thirds vote of the city council. I want to reiterate to the public and the council that I think the purpose for us hosting this meeting tonight was to have open and meaningful uh, dialogue as we uh, consider restrictions that would be specific to October 30th and October 31st, coinciding with our Halloween uh, holidays. We know can get fairly busy in whitefish and a potential um, super spreader event, which being our concern. I'm going to briefly. Uh, walk through the ordinance, which has been posted and made available publicly since last uh, Thursday. Uh, I'm then going to turn it over to Tom Lee Robinson, who is joining us this evening. She is the health officer with the Flathead County Health Department. Tom Lee, thanks for very much for attending uh, this evening. Um, after we hear uh, from Tam Lee, I'll give the opportunity for the council to ask questions. And of course, Angela Jacobs, our city attorney, as well as our uh, police chief and assistant chief are here this evening if staff or council have any questions uh, for them as well. So I'm gonna go ahead and move through ordinance 20-16 again, which is an emergency ordinance of the city council of the city of Whitefish, Montana, enacting restrictions upon gatherings and businesses to help reduce the spread of COVID-19 which would again waive a second reading and go into effect immediately. Whereas on March 11th, 2020, the World Health Organization declared a global pandemic due to the spread of novel coronavirus COVID-19. And whereas on March 18th, 2020, the Flathead County Board of Commissioners declared a state of emergency related to COVID-19. And whereas on March 19th, 2020, Mayor John Wolfell declared a state of emergency related to COVID-19. And whereas on April 22nd, 2020, Governor Steve Bullock issued a directive establishing the phased reopening of Montana. Whereas on July 15th, 2020, Governor Steve Bullock issued a directive mandating the use of face coverings in public places with certain exceptions. And whereas since the phased reopening of Montana, Flathead County has experienced a significant increase of COVID-19 cases and currently has more active cases than every other Montana County except Yellowstone County. And whereas in the two weeks prior to October 9th, 2020, Flathead County had 889 new COVID cases and four new COVID related deaths. And whereas COVID Flathead capacity indicators, which provide criteria and associated data to be considered by the Flathead County City Health Department show the county is functioning at critical levels in four of seven categories, including case investigation capacity, community concern, and hospitalizations. And whereas of October 9th, 2020, 10 long-term care facilities had current outbreaks of COVID-19, limiting the ability of hospitals to discharge patients into such facilities. And whereas according to the Flathead City County Health Department, in the last seven months, Flathead County has had 23 deaths from COVID-19, greater than the 19 total deaths from influenza in just the past four years. And whereas the rapid and significant spread of COVID-19 in our community is placing pressure upon the healthcare system, public health staff, city and county resources, and schools. And whereas the city is deeply committed to protecting its most vulnerable citizens, ensuring the healthcare system is not overwhelmed and keeping its schools open. And whereas the city also recognizes that its citizens and business owners desire and that it is in the best economic interest of the community for its businesses to remain open. And whereas protecting public health is a valid objective for the exercise of the city's police power, and whereas preventing the further community spread of COVID-19 during the holiday, Halloween holiday constitute, constitutes an emergency situation affecting public health, safety, and general welfare. And whereas placing restrictions on businesses and gatherings during the dates of October 30 
in October 31, 2020 is in the best interest of the city. Now, therefore, be it ordained by the City Council of the City of Whitefish, Montana, if this ordinance does indeed pass by a two-thirds vote of the seated councilors, we will read as follows. Section one, all of the recitals set forth above are hereby adopted as findings of fact. Section two, no public or private gatherings larger than 10 individuals may be held unless it is possible to maintain six feet of social distancing for the dates only of October 30th and October 31st, 2020. Restaurants, bars, breweries, distilleries, and casinos must operate at 50% capacity on these two dates of October 30th and October 31st, 2020. Restaurants, bars, and casinos must close their doors and have all patrons out by 11.30 p.m. during the dates of October 30 and October 31st, 2020. Breweries and distilleries must comply with state law regarding closing times. Section five, restaurants, bars, breweries, distilleries, and casinos must limit seating to six individuals per table during the dates of October 30th and October 31st, 2020. Section six, restaurants, bars, breweries, distilleries, and casinos must prohibit individuals from sitting or standing at bars or counters during the dates of October 30 and 31, 2020. Section seven, restaurants, bars, brewery, distilleries, and casinos shall continue to comply with all social distancing and face covering requirements under, issued under Governor Bullock's previous directives. Again, Governor Bullock's directives, not the city of Whitefish. Section eight, houses of worship may exceed the group size of 10, subject to the limit of 50% capacity and compliance with social distancing and face covering requirements during the dates of October 30 and 31, 2020. Section nine, under previous directives issued by Governor Bullock, all decision-making for local school districts will remain with local districts and school boards for all school activities. And finally, section 10, children, child care facilities in recognition of their critical role in supporting the workforce, workforce excuse me, are exempt from limitations upon group size. That's an overview of the ordinance. A full ordinance has been posted to the city's website and advertised for public comment uh, since last Thursday. So if you'd like to read the document, it's entire, it is certainly available for public dissemination. Uh, with that said, I would like to welcome and family, we very much appreciate you taking your time this evening uh, to meet with us. And as a reminder to those participating tonight, Emily Robinson is the health officer uh, with the Flathead City County Health Department. And we welcome her tonight. Thanks, Tom. Thank you, and thank you so much for having me. Um, and thank you for um, bringing this uh, forward. I really appreciate your efforts to help stop the spread of COVID in our community. And I think it's a very reasonable approach to limit the spread of COVID and, um, you know, safeguard our, our communities and also safeguard our, our businesses and our economy because our our main goal here is to stop the spread of COVID, help keep our schools open, um, keep our businesses open, and let our hospital and medical community be able to stay open for things other than just COVID. So I think this is a very reasonable approach. Um, I wanna give you like the latest stats we have. Uh, we currently have 16 people in the hospital today. Eight of them are Flathead County residents. Uh, uh, many of the hospitals across the state have gone into divert. That means they cannot, can no longer accept patients, and so they're diverting them to the other hospitals. So we currently have been taking patients from uh, quite a few from Browning, the Browning area, um, Hamilton, Butte, Glasgow, Malta, all across the state. Our hospital have taken taken in patients from. Um, so eight of the ones currently are from Flathead County that are in the hospital. Are, um, we have a total of 3,084 3, cases. Um, currently active, we have around 651. The, the stats on the state website last week, there was a data lag and they were, were not exactly correct. They are correct now. So I think we're about third or fourth in line for active cases. 
I believe last week it said we had 1,380 some cases. We actually have 651. Um, we've had 26 deaths. We had three deaths just last week. Um, in the Whitefish schools, we currently have had 24 cases, active cases in the school amongst the kids and 10 with uh, the staff in your schools. Um, we currently have 33 people working in our office uh, temp temps and we have 11 of our full-time public health staff have, that have been diverted to working on COVID. Uh, and uh, Bill, the chairman of our board is, is on the call today. He's been doing some statistic work and I, I believe our our rates are doubling every 28 to 30 days. Is that, I, I believe that's what Bill's graph had shown. Um, other than that, um, I'd be happy to answer any questions. The question, John. You're muted, John. Sorry, Tamley, thanks uh, very much for the update. I also wanted to thank you and the department for updating the county website. I don't know if folks are aware, but we can now go online live and see uh, a breakdown of the number of uh, cases based on, I believe, municipality or zip code. So I think that was a very helpful addition uh, to share with uh, the Florida County at large. Anyway, thanks very much. Yeah, I'm I go ahead. We've go ahead, been asked for that quite a few times, so we finally got that added on. That's wonderful. Um, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, well, we need to go through the individual numbers right now. I would like to now offer the council an opportunity to ask Tamley any questions because we are meeting remotely. I'll go ahead and ask each individual counselor. Um, and this is also an opportunity if you have questions for Angela or Angela, if you have anything you'd like to share with us regarding uh, the ordinance. So we'll go ahead and start with Frank. Frank, any questions for Tamley or Angie for that matter? Um, Tamley, question for you is, given the numbers that we're seeing, what kind of uh, burdens or lag time are we having on tracing the contacts of those that are actually ill and have got COVID? Uh, we normally like to turn it around in 24 hours and the, with the school cases, we're still turning them around the same day that we get the lab cases. So we've tried to prioritize those. Right now, we're probably 80 cases behind, so that's probably at least one day behind on cases. Okay. And, and in terms of the numbers that you have, Tamily, of, of people that you're having to keep track of or trace, as it were, what kind of numbers, what, what number of people are we having to, are you having to contact or trace given the, the, the numbers that we're looking at here? Okay, so for each case, we probably do on average five to six um, contacts, but in school cases, we do up to 10 to 15 contacts, and we're taking actually taking those kids out of school. So, um, you know, uh, there's, there's a lot of kids we're taking out of school, and it's kind of a revolving door, but, you know, we realize the importance of keeping schools open. So um, we do those cases, we turn those around the same day we get them. Thank you, that's all I have. Thank you, Frank. And questions for Tamley or Angie? Uh, just a quick question for Tamley, I guess, just having gone through that my wife's business. Have we made any improvements on turnaround time for testing? She was actually pretty lucky, although the employee that she had that tested positive was tested on a Tuesday and we didn't find out until Friday, although the entire staff was tested on Friday and we found out on Sunday, so that was fairly rapid, but I know for businesses it is a concern and I realize something you don't have control over, but kind of where are we at with that right now? Um, right now, when uh, the... Kalispell Regional has the ability, they expect, the state lab expanded their testing capability to the hospital here. And so I believe they have the ability to test, I think it's around eight, 800 to 1,000 tests a day right now. And so with our testing, when we identify a contact, we can get that turned around pretty quickly and they're flagged as, um, uh, so they go through the system faster. I know some of the Testing at KRH, people are getting their results the same day. But 
if you're not flagged as a um, priority, some of the places it'll take a couple of days to get those back, two to three days, which, you know, is not all that long, but um, yeah, I'm, everybody likes to have everything back instantly. I realize that, but there is a lot of testing capability in the, in the Valley right now. Uh, thank you. So follow up to that. What is the current positivity rate in Flathead County? Um, I think it's 13, 13 percent. Okay. Uh, no other questions right now, Tamalee. Thank you very much okay. for joining us tonight. Thanks, Andy. We'll move on to Ben. Any questions for Tamalee? Emily, thank you very much for joining us. We appreciate it. Um, my, my first question is, if you have any information, either statistical or anecdotal, about what is really causing the spread? And I know that we've heard about bars, restaurants, um, schools, you know, work, people from out of state. Um, what are the key things that you're seeing in terms of what is causing the spread uh, and where, like where in our community is that happening? We had a long list already that is contributing that the schools are doing a great job within the schools. The kids are wearing masks. We haven't seen a lot of transmission in the school setting, but it's the activities that the school kids are taking part in outside of the school walls. Um, we see a lot of kids who for some reason have uh, some lumber parties or they have the whole team to come over and spend the night on a weekend and they have a hot tub party. So a lot of that, the school cases are coming from outside the school walls. Uh, another big, we find quite frequently is weddings. Um, everyone's at a wedding, they pretty much know everybody. They, I, I guess you feel like you can't get sick from your own relatives. I'm not really sure what that concept is, but a lot of people don't wear a mask in rel at, at weddings and you know, uh, a lot of the groups, the bachelorette parties, the bachelor parties, they seem to be kind of a big spreader of COVID as well. So it's kind of those dinner parties. We see a lot of people where they'll have uh, six or eight couples over for dinner. One of them has COVID not knowing because you're contagious um, uh, two days before you have signs and symptoms. And then, you know, we'll have like three or four of the people in the dinner party convert to positive. So it's a lot of those kind of intimate and it, situations where you're kind of face to face with people. Uh, and now that we're moving indoors and that we're having meetings and functions inside where you're sitting at a table with people, um, that's what we anticipate will drive it now. But another thing that is driving our numbers up a little bit is because of the availability of testing we're seeing whole families go in and get tested. So it's not uncommon for us to get four or five positives in one family. And so the numbers do add up pretty quickly when you're getting four and five family members testing at a time. Do you see restaurants as being a significant contributor to the spread? What we see more is the staff. Um, the staff in those establishments are usually younger in their 20s to 30s or 20 to, to 40s. So, and that's carrying the largest burden of the, the virus in our community is that age range of, of young adults, I would say. And so uh, we find it very common where we have uh, restaurants where the staff all work, they all work with each other, but they all hang out with each other after hours and then some of them work at multiple bars and restaurants and so we've had big outbreaks in that age range of workers um, and then unfortunately a lot of the restaurants that have had that they've ended up closing their doors because they don't have the staff to run or they close down and do a deep cleaning which we really appreciate um, so I wouldn't say it's it's more the staff, workers, the age range, and what they do outside of the walls, again, um, in the evenings, hanging out together, stuff like that. Thank you. That's really insightful. Um, I'm just curious, it, are the measures that are being proposed here today, how do they compare to 
the measures that were being proposed um, at the recent county health board meeting? Um, we we proposed something a little bit different, and they came from the CDC guideline guidelines on mitigation um, ways to miti mitigate the spread of COVID within a community. So um, I really appreciate your approach, where it's just a high incident night um, being over the Halloween weekend. So I think yours is isn't it fifty percent capacity? Is that yeah. yes? Yeah. And then um, we had a, also we proposed a large gathering cap of 500 in, in our other proposal. If, if the measures that were proposed here tonight, we're not here to discuss that really as making them permanent, but if they were permanent, do you feel that this would make a difference, a significant difference, hopefully? in the spread of coronavirus around here? Are you talking about making them permanent or over this weekend? I'm talking about making them permanent. I, I know that the ordinance in front of us is for this weekend, but um, I'm also you know, wondering about the future as well. I think any time you're closing things down, people aren't in contact with each other, right? So, I mean, I, I think any time you're closing something down, there's naturally going to be, it'll stop the spread because people aren't hanging out with each other. Um, so, I, yes, I do believe it would because it, it's just a natural thing in this sense, right? I have one last question is, um, I'm wondering if, if you know what, what the current status of the discussions at the health board are and if you think any of the restrictions that are proposed here tonight may um, eventually be adopted by the health board, or do you feel that uh, most likely uh, what we've seen is, is what we're gonna get from them? Uh, right now, we have just uh, rewritten the, um, the cap on events uh, order, and we modified them with a language that was the people who voted against it were opposed to. And so um, we're hoping to reintroduce that uh, this week. When is the next meeting that that will be taken up? If we were to bring that forward, it would be it have to be a special meeting just like this is of yours. No, that's it. Thank you very much. Thanks, Ben. Uh, we'll move on to Rebecca. Any questions for Tamalee or Angie this evening? Yes, I do. Thank you, Tamalee. Um, this is Rebecca. And I just read that the CDC said prolonged exposure is now 15 minutes cumulative, not just a one time event. Um, and that's, that means that someone could contact someone that's infectious for two minutes and then go on to another person for three minutes and then five minutes and so after 15 minutes they would be infected is is that how you're interpreting that too i think it was um targeted more towards a setting where um take a school for instance so if you were in a school setting and there was a positive case in there uh depending on what with younger kids or older kids, it's a little bit different how the teacher interacts with them. So um, is it a, a constant 15 minutes within six feet with one child, or is it a teaching situation where the teacher wouldn't specifically be spending a solid 15 minutes with that child, but within that hour or so, um, it would be a cumulative of 15 minutes if they were helping that child in more than one um, uh, instance at a time. Grocery stores and the clerk had the mask below their nose and then two people came in unmasked and I was thinking how easy it is to transmit if someone's infected. Are we still at the the idea that about 40% of people are asymptomatic? 
I, um, I, I think you're thinking of it as opposite. Okay. So we're trying to determine if a positive had a contact, a cumulative contact with one person for 15 minutes. Uh, you're thinking of it, I think, as the opposite way if, if the clerk was in contact with more than, is that how you're looking at it? Well, it, it just, I knew that in the, in the beginning it was that you, the viral load would be about 15 minutes, mm -hmm. um, which would be dangerous to someone and they could get infected. But when they changed the guidelines um, to say it was a cumulative amount, it just seemed like it was a little bit more toxic or something, but I think that's okay. We don't have to go too long on this. I, um, I was just wondering too about um, if the testing accuracy is more reliable now, and also if you could discuss how enforcement is being handled at this point. The tests, I'm not a lab person, so we get the positive tests and I, so I can't really answer to the, the lab, the accuracy of the labs. Um, we only get the positives and then we take the positive from there and then do our investigation. And so are you talking about the, when you're asking about the enforcement, are you talk, talking about the mask enforcement? Yeah, and and just we've had difficulty because so many people are divided on this in our county. And I just was, um, we just are now having enforcement come through the governor. And I'm just wondering if you could um, talk a little bit about how people are supposed to be doing enforcement, I guess, um, in the Valley, how you would like to see that done. Okay, I'll, I'll tell you how the process works in our, in our part of the enforcement. So our enforcement is, it comes through on our, our website, we have a complaint form and all those complaint forms go to the environmental health staff. And then we have a process of, if they get five complaints, which is, it can't be the same person. So five complaints from different people at that point in time, that that triggers our environmental health staff. Um, they will actually make a call to the business and try to do some education with them. And then, then we continue, we have a database which we keep all of this, we continue. And then at a, another certain uh, point, the environmental health staff will actually go and do a visit to that business and again, try to do some education. And then, um, First we do a letter and then it, it goes more and then they do a, an actual uh, visit. And then at a certain point, we turn that over to the county attorney for um, legal action. And then at that point in time, it's the county attorney's responsibility to whether or not they pursue a uh, legal action against that business. Have we had the, the county attorney do any legal action to date? No. Yeah, that's what I thought. Okay. All right. I really appreciate your efforts. I guess the only last question I had is um, one of the doctors that I know said that we should be aiming for a 5% positivity rate. So if we were to get there, how, how stringent do we need to be with our mandates? in our laws like how would you like to see us get there and when do you think we could get to five percent or less I, that's a big crystal ball and my crystal ball not quite that good um i i don't know i you know no one knows what you know what the virus is going to do or so i really can't answer that question okay we'll just keep doing what we're doing i guess thank you very very much though you're welcome Thanks, Rebecca. Uh, I know Ryan was having difficulty. Ryan Hennon, are you back on with us? I have audio, Mr. Mayor. Great. Any any questions for Tamil? I'm glad you're back. Uh, yes, I have a question. Why isn't the county attorney feeling the need to uh, enforce anything? 
I, you would have to ask him that question. I've had, I've had conversations with him, but he, he would have to answer that himself. Okay. I, I, I will say that I was happy that the governor, the governor stepped in and actually uh, filed some. Okay. Okay. I don't have any further questions at this time. Thanks, Ron. And finally, Steve, any questions for Tamalee or Angie? Yes, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, thanks for coming, Tamalee. We really appreciate you being here. Um, I, I do have a number of questions. Uh, first, it, I mean, it strikes me that now that we're getting more testing, we're seeing higher rates. Would that, would that extrapolate to mean that there are a lot of people that have had this thing that don't know if they've had it, that um, maybe just didn't get tested, that kind of suffered through it? I, I don't know why they would go and get tested now if they weren't symptomatic. I don't, but, but to your point, I mean, somebody will pop a, a positive test up to 90 days after they've had the virus. So, I mean, that's certainly a possibility. Anybody that we're sending is, um, either symptomatic or, you know, they're a contact to somebody who has been a lab confirmed test. Um, I just don't know why somebody who wasn't symptomatic would just go and get tested. Okay, thank you. Um, and then on that idea of close contact, how, walk me through how, how it's determined who is a close contact of somebody who has tested positive. Um, are you talking about a workplace setting or a household or a school or uh, well, well, I'll, I'll tell you the definition. You said that five or six, that you usually end up calling five or six people close contacts of somebody that's tested positive. Right. It seems to me that that may be low. I don't know. Uh, um, so that's people. probably a low number, depending on how many people are in the household with them. Usually everyone that lives in a household with a positive will go under quarantine for 14 days. Um, another place we're seeing quite a few cases is in a workplace setting where the people are familiar with each other, they're in a close proximity um, where they work with each other every day. And so the definition of a close contact is with being within six feet of a, a lab confirmed test for at least 15 minutes of time. So um, that's what the definition of a close contact is. And is that, that, but that has to be self-reported by the, um, by the yes. person who, who tests positive. Yes. So we have to rely on who they are, who they report as being in close contact with. Is that correct? Yes. We would have no other way of knowing. Okay. Um, Except I mean, for the school in schools, schools, Yeah. In schools, you get, you get the, I'm a school teacher, so I kind of know. A little oh, okay. Bit. So you get the seating charts and find out who was there. Right. Okay, um, and then uh, kind of off of that, how, how difficult is it to tell how this thing is spreading? I mean, Ben was kind of angling for uh, this idea that we don't really know if it's restaurants are really causing this. Uh, how difficult is it to tell how this is spreading? Well, um, to me, I've been in infectious diseases for a long time, so it reminds me more of kind of TB, the way TB is spread. You're within somebody's space for a limited, you know, a, a certain amount of time and it's spread through through droplets. So that's what it reminds me of. Um, I, I think okay. we're learning more and more all the time. I'll get it in the morning. I'm in a meeting tonight. Okay. Um, and then, so let me just run through some of the things. Uh, no standing or sitting at a bar. Is that likely to help curb the spread? Yes, because at a bar, um, you're not wearing a mask because you're drinking and eating stuff, right? So if you're shoulder to shoulder with just with someone, like in a bar setting, um, you're more likely to be um, transferring that that virus to a person who's so close in within your space. Okay. Uh, what about limiting the capacity of restaurants to? Um, Right now we're at 75%. Was does 50%? I mean, you said earlier anything where we're having less contact is better. Is 50% good, or I mean, is that, how do we judge? It, you know that, and that's a good question. You know, it's hard to have broad brush strokes 
you know, without looking at a restaurant, you know, how, what is their capacity? How far apart are their tables? Um, so, you know, that's, that's, a, that's a tough one because it depends on, you know, we, we want to have people at least six feet away from each other, you know, can those are those tables six feet from each other. And so then if there's somebody who has a lab, their lab positive or they're they're spreading the virus before they're even even knowing it you know they're just affecting those people sitting at the table with them and not affecting the people sitting at the table next to them okay so if they got up and walked through the restaurant to go to the restroom and they didn't put their mask on then they would be putting more people at risk um yes especially if they were coughing or sneezing okay and aerosolizing the virus okay um uh one more question about that is, is so if we don't take any action on this what is the likely outcome for for our county for our town i mean what do you see happening if we take no action because the county has deferred it to us in my opinion um i it you know i again i don't have a crystal ball but i have looked at bills um projections and it would be our case if it stayed the way it was it would be doubling the cases every 28 to 30 days that's the projection we're on now okay. will it stay like that I, I don't know okay um and then um the other question i have is about enforcement uh the governor released five million dollars last week for enforcement to the counties and so far only four counties have taken him up on that is there anything you can do in your position to try to get some of that money to, to help enforcement in our county? Or does that have to come through the commissioners or from the greater board of health? Um, we are getting um, some of that money. Uh, we just, uh, I think it arrives next week. We are also seeking out, I don't know if you're aware of what Yellowstone was doing. They were hiring, um, they called them, uh, let me look to see what they call them. Special investigators, I think. Yes, uh, COVID education liaisons, that's oh, what we yeah. call them. So um, today I worked on um, getting uh, funding to do that in our county. So I'm working on that right now. And, and what would that person then do? Uh, they would, um, right now, um, the governor set up a complaint base on the state website. And so they were pushing out all the complaints from different counties to the local lead officials, which is our office. Um, we got 76 on Friday. Um, so it will be managing that database, those complaints, responding to those complaints, putting them in our current database, which we already had, and then um, carrying out the process that I spoke to you about earlier, about doing the, the visits, the letter, uh, and then um, turning them over to the county attorney. The piece I don't know is if um, our county attorney will be the ones um, carrying forward with that or if the state will continue to do that enforcement piece. I, I don't know that yet. Okay. And it's so, so any of those complaints are going to have to be enforced through, the, through your office. Is that correct? the pro they'll go through the process at our office the enforcement will come i'm not sure if it will come from our county attorney or if the state will continue to do that is there anything I that piece is there anything a municipality can do in terms of that enforcement can our city attorney file something or does it have to come from a county because they're the ones who issue issue health licenses well this is the process and we, what we're actually doing here is we are enforcing the governor's masking directive. Right. Right. So that's what we're doing. Okay. Okay. Um, thank you. I really appreciate all the work you're doing and I know that your job cannot be easy. Um, so, uh, thank you for, for being out there on the front line. Emily. Thank you. Thanks very much, Steve. Sorry about that earlier. I got disconnected from the conference call and had to make a phone call to get back on. Uh, anyway, I, I had one question, and it's related to some of the urge direction 
that your department issued in a press release, I believe it was last, last week, urging county residents to limit close non-household contacts to no more than six individuals per week and recommending people who interact with non-household contacts you do so for 15 minutes or fewer whenever possible. Um, I believe it also encouraged residents to utilize takeout restaurant delivery services and in general focus on minimizing how frequently individuals can leave their homes, the number of locations they travel to, the amount of time spent at those locations, et cetera. Uh, can you just very briefly uh, touch on that direction that was provided and whether or not you see additional urged directives coming out of your department in the next several weeks? Okay, um, I release those because those are the ways that everyday citizens can take personal responsibility to help stop the spread of COVID in the community. Um, if, if we weren't going to be able to go through uh, mitigation restrictions, that's one thing that the people can actually be responsible and do themselves, do for themselves, you know, to help mitigate the, the, the COVID spread in the community. That's why I release those. And that they came, they come right out of the CDC guidelines of mitigation um, reduction in, in a community. That's where they came from. Okay. I appreciate that. Uh, thanks, Council, for your questions. If Tamali, Tamali, and of course, your time this evening. Tamali, I just wanted to give uh, City Attorney uh, Jacobs, do you have anything to add uh, regarding the reading of the ordinance or anything that was brought up this evening? I don't. Thank you. Thanks very much, Angie. Further questions or comments from the council before we open the public hearing this evening? Steve. Thanks, John. I just have one question for Angie. Um, and that is uh, about the uh, the penalty piece. Um, I, I, don't, I don't pretend to have the code, uh, the city code memorized, but it says that the penalty is, can be People can be assessed a municipal a municipal infraction under section one dash four dash four. What what is that one, Angie? Is that a, is that a, a monetary penalty? It is a monetary penalty, Steve. So we are kind of constricted by our code um, with respect to how far we can go with our penalties. So I mean, the penalty could be up to five hundred dollars. Um, that's about as far as our code will take us. Okay, and that would be assessed to businesses, not individuals, correct? Correct. If somebody, if, we're, if they're found in violation of the masking ordinance or this ordinance? That's correct, Steve. Okay, thank you. That's all I have. Thanks, John. Thanks, Steve. Any further questions for the council or staff for that matter before we open our public hearing? Not seeing any, we did advertise for a public hearing on what will be our own ordinance 20. Dash 16, an emergency ordinance establishing restrictions upon businesses to help limit the spread of COVID-19 on October 30th and October 31st, 2020 only. And we'll go ahead and hold that public hearing now. I'd like to invite Chris Hunt, our IT specialist, to help me uh, direct public comment. I know that many of you have, are participating tonight remotely, and I'll going to turn this over to Chris now to uh, manage the public comment period of this hearing, and then I'll turn it back to Michelle Howe to provide a quick summary on the written comments that we received before 4 p.m. Uh, this evening. Chris, thanks very much. Okay, no problem. Um, so for our uh, people that are attending using the WebEx uh, application on their computer, uh, next to your name under the participant list, you have a little hand um, that you can click on. That hand is a little white dot with a little hand implement it. Uh, if you will raise, click on that to raise your hand, uh, that will let us know that you want to speak. For the folks that are on the telephone, you can use star three to raise your hand. Um, to signify that you would like to make comments. And then when you are finished uh, speaking, you would click star three again to lower your hand. And also again, for people using the WebEx application, um, 
when you do raise your hand after you've had your opportunity to speak, if you would click on that again and to lower your hand, that way we'll know uh, that you're finished. So if we could, um, you can start raising your hands and we'll see who, if anybody has anything to speak, say. And I'll just add one thing, Chris, in the, mm -hmm. out of consideration for time and those that do wanna provide comment this evening, and I can guarantee this council read every written comment that was submitted by 4 p.m. today. So those written comments are part of the public record and we appreciate you submitting those. But if you could please limit your public comment this evening uh, to three minutes, it would help us uh, run a more orderly and efficient meeting and uh, transition to a discussion amongst the council members following our, the closing of our public hearing. So thanks very much for uh, respecting that request. And our first person is going to be, uh, will be Betsy on to you unmuted and you just let us your name and address and then make your comment. I'm Betsy Konstam and I live at 573 Summers Avenue. Thanks to all the city council members for their willingness to serve on the council right now. As a Whitefish City um, School Board member, I have some understanding of what this year's like for those of us trying to make decisions. And I'll be really brief. I signed up here to comment just in favor of your proposed ordinances for Halloween weekend. And I wish they could go beyond just these two days. With the rise in cases all fall, even in our school's hybrid schedule at the moment, with children attending just two days a week, keeping our schools open has been really challenging. We have very few substitutes. And at one point recently, we had both administrators at one of our schools out quarantining. I am worried that we will have to go to 100% remote in one or more of our schools due to many teachers and students being infected. And educating kids remotely is really not a good option as we found out last spring. As leadership beyond our town has struggled to make good decisions to protect our community, this crisis has finally come right down to us here in Whitefish. And I'm pleased to hear that a joint group has been formed with the school district, the city government, and some local medical professionals to offer guidance to us on the local level. Who would have ever guessed that we would need to do this? Thanks again for helping to make Halloween weekend a little safer for our community. And I hope that these ordinances can be extended beyond these few days so we can stop the spread in our community. Many thanks. Thanks, Betsy. Our next is uh, John Middleton and you're unmuted. Hello, everybody. Thank you for the opportunity. Uh, um, uh, I will keep this very brief. I, I agree 100% uh, with what Betsy just said. Um, the nation is in uncontrolled spread. Uh, you know, I think that Council's swift action initially at the onset of this pandemic uh, with the mask ordinance was was wise and demonstrated uh, smart leadership. And I think we desperately need more of that right now. Uh, so I would also say I would encourage you to uh, to pass this uh, for Halloween, but also give serious consideration uh, to making it a more permanent in nature um, so we can do everything in our power to protect the community. Uh, and and that, that's all I've got on that. So thank you very much for the opportunity. I appreciate the work that you all do and um, look forward to hearing how you decide this one tonight. Thanks, John. Good to see you. Likewise. Okay, I'm not seeing any further hands raised at the moment. Oh, I've got one more hand, two more hands. <laughs> so um, our next is, I can only go by the initials of MC. You are unmuted. If you'd state your name and your address, I'd appreciate it. Hi, my name is Megan Chason and I wanted to, um, sorry, address 704 Cedar Street here in Whitefish, Montana. And I wanted to say that I really applaud the leadership of our city council um, earlier in this pandemic, both in March when we initially acted very swiftly to move bars and restaurants to takeout status. 
I want to also applaud you in July when we met to decide about a mask ordinance in advance of the statewide ordinance that the governor passed later. Um, you guys have done an awesome job of leading the way and I wanna encourage you to continue that trend and with what we're seeing, um, we've heard tonight from Tamalee and others that our, our positivity rate is at 13%. We're shooting for under five. Um, so 13% is considerably higher than under 5% and enough that it's just really hard to, to track and to contact trace and to maintain a normal course of life in our schools and in our businesses and um, to keep our, our citizens of our town healthy. Um, in terms of thinking about what to do, um, we need some sort of restrictions. And so however you decide to set those restrictions, I applaud you and encourage you for setting restrictions. Um, any and all opportunities to limit people in close contact, certainly in the bar setting. And I realize um, that as Tamalee was talking, um, bars were not named as a major spreading site. But if we think about how that contact tracing is done, where you have to name the people who you've been in contact with for 15 minutes, I just really think that we're not gonna um, see it that way. We're just seeing it as sort of miscellaneous community spread. So that is a bars and restaurants are times when people have their masks off and when they're in close contact. And I think that's something here in Whitefish, um, we certainly have a number of bars and restaurants and that would be a great place to focus energy on reducing capacity, encouraging takeout. Um, we saw that work really well in the spring. You dropped cases back down to zero for our community and for our county, which is awesome. Um, and I would encourage you to step up once again and to help lead the way. So thank you for all the work that you're doing. And uh, to mimic what others have said, um, I would also encourage you to go beyond Halloween weekend and, and continue these ordinances. Thank you. Thanks, MC. Okay, next we have Amy. And if you would state your name and address. Which one? This one right here? Yes. Hi. <laughs> <It's just> Amy. <laughs> um, I'm Amy Boring and I'm at 123 Colorado. And I'm going to be brief as well. I just wanted to thank <clears throat> City Council and everybody that is working really hard um, to keep everybody safe and businesses open. Um, I support uh, mandates, whatever you guys feel necessary um, going forward, even beyond Halloween. Uh, I think it's important that tourists know, well, and locals as well, um, that people live here <laughs> and they come and go and they should respect, you know, what's going on and not treat it like we're Disneyland. So, um, yeah, that's about it. I just support everything that you guys put in place. And I just wanted to thank you for your time and effort. And it's nice to see some of you. I haven't seen you in a while. <laughs> Thanks, Amy. Appreciate your comments tonight. Thanks, Steve. And next we have Lauren, and I will uh, get you unmuted if you'd state your name and address. Sure. Lauren Osolowski, uh, 503 Railway Street um, in Whitefish. And I want to start off by saying, I really appreciate um, that our municipality is taking this seriously and it is a serious issue. Um, so thank you council and Mayor Mulfeld for um, addressing this. I would also like to say as a business owner in town who has been taking this very seriously from the onset, um, I'm a little concerned that the, we, can, we can enforce more restrictions, but if or we can, we can implement further restriction, but if it's not enforced, it isn't going to make a difference. And, um, you know, there are a few businesses in town, bars and restaurants that aren't taking it seriously. Um, but as Tamalee said, you know, there, there doesn't seem to be a huge spread happening from people uh, going out to the bars and restaurants if the bar and restaurant is, is adhering to the six feet spacing between the tables, is not allowing people to just stand in their establishment. 
and at Spotted Bear, we've taken it really seriously. And, and we thank goodness for so many reasons haven't had to shut down. Um, and I know that might be a matter of time, but I think, I guess there's three things that I, that I am thinking about right now. The first is Flathead County is large. And when I drive by Columbia Falls Elementary School, I see kiddos just running around the playground without masks, tackling each other. And um, I know Whitefish School District has been taking it seriously, but I think, you know, Kalispell is very different when I go down to Hutton Ranch versus walking around the shops in downtown Whitefish. And I would be curious to know how much of the spread is happening in Whitefish versus the rest of the county. It's a pretty, pretty big spread there. Um, the second is enforcing these regulations to target a couple of bars on a weekend when they'll be busy is going to actually impact dozens and dozens of small businesses. Restaurants like Lula's and the Buffalo that aren't even open in the evening are going to have to further restrict. And I can tell you all that we had a 50% loss this July over last July because we were very regulated with the number of bodies we could have in our space. And so we've shifted to adapt, but um, you know, if you, if you go back down to 50% and bars get a $500 slap on the wrist, which is nothing, they'll make that up the next night by packing people in. And then, you, you know, my business and a lot of the businesses in town that are taking it seriously and, and our rule followers, um, are going to further lose revenue and it's hard to make ends meet right now. It is hard to pay our employees. Um, it is hard to look at the number of heads you can fit in responsibly and try to pencil out how how you're going to make up that loss of revenue. Um, so I would just encourage looking at the problem holistically and what possible um, restrictions there are to implement. And if going down to 50% and not enforcing it is going to actually solve any of the problems and, and it make an impact on the spikes we're seeing. So thank you all. Thanks very much, Lauren. Okay, if we have anyone else uh, that would like to speak, if you could uh, raise your hands, we will notice you. Um, next is Rhonda Fitzgerald. Rhonda, if you could state your name and address and your. Hi, okay. I'm uh, Rhonda Fitzgerald, 412 Lupfer Avenue. Um, Thank you, Council and Mayor, for the, taking on this really thorny problem. Um, it is super unfortunate that it has come down to Whitefish uh, taking these actions. Um, it's too bad that it, the uh, powers that be in, at the county don't, um, don't take this on for us, but I really admire you for being willing to look out for our community. Um, I do support your proposal uh, and I agree with several people that it might be necessary to extend the time frame for it um, because we must, must um, do everything we can to ensure that our community is safe and healthy as much as we, we can. Um, and I think our future as a community depends on us having a reputation for that. I think this sort of fairly well attitude that seems to be prevailing across the county is really bad long term for Whitefish's uh, reputation. So I think it's important to uh, step up and take difficult actions. But I do want to also encourage you to obviously for enforcement because I know many businesses have commented to me that they do follow the rules and some don't and everyone's getting punished. Um, for the people who aren't necessarily following the rules. So I do think there's some form of enforcement that you need to consider. Um, and I also would, would really want to encourage you to advocate as strongly as you can as a governing body for there to be additional financial relief to the businesses that are getting hit really hard. It's been a tough eight months for the frontline type businesses, uh, hospitality, shops. Um, these are the small businesses that form the backbone of the community and we want them to make it. And when you tell someone 50% capacity, that's 50% of their revenue is gone. And it's really hard to stay in business month after month or even year after year with that kind of reduction. And 
they're they're if they're willing to do something for the community the community should help them as well and so you know i know that at the state there are significant cares act funds still available um i would urge you to encourage that there be more of that released to support businesses that are making these sacrifices and i think um also uh there needs to be more federal support for businesses that are being so badly affected because about half our economy relies on the types of businesses that are having to reduce their capacity bars restaurants hotels small shops and the other half of our economy relies on this being a really nice town to live in and without all those businesses it won't necessarily be so i think the the kind of grimace you are seeing or hearing from small businesses is that they've already made really significant sacrifices and um and it's hard to see how we'll all get through this financially so i would hope that whatever influence you can bring to bear you would use that to help the businesses who you're asking to make these sacrifices thank you thanks very much rhonda and next uh we have jody you're trying to get you unmuted and you're unmuted jody okay hi my name is jody petlin i have a small business in whitefish that i've had here since 2006 and it's called shanti yoga um and we've had to our space is pretty small so we've turned all of our public classes into zoom classes um to try to keep our students safe and our teachers safe um of course people are getting really sick of zoom so we've taken a huge hit um over the over these months um but we think really that's the safest way to go so we're going to continue on um i and the teachers at my studio support everything the city council is doing and we really appreciate it uh, we want to thank each of you and um we are for uh restrictions after halloween uh, um to try to get it under control um and i had a question i don't know that really anyone can answer but it's just in my head when i was listening to the conversation um when people come here for weddings so they 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 come to Whitefish because it's a destination. They want to get married here, but they turn it into a super spreader event. How does that get managed? Um, and I don't think anyone can really answer my question. I'm just sort of putting a blanket question out there. Like if there's going to be enforcement, like in spring or when, when people start coming back for weddings and things like that, um, I know a photographer who told me this story about the same thing that Tam Lee was talking about, which is, people coming here, huge groups of people, they're friends, they feel safe, they don't wear their masks and they're staying at the resorts and it's just spreading it all over the place. So I think there's something about maybe, again, if there's going to be restrictions, more restrictions, something for the resorts to consider, maybe they have to let their guests know that if they're doing an event there, there has to be some guidelines about it. It's just a thought and a question that was floating around my head when I was hearing it. So um, I probably had some other things, but I think I'll end it there. And um, just uh, thank you to all of you for what you're doing for our city. Thanks, Jody. Okay. Uh, give another minute to see if there's anyone else that would like to make any comments. not seeing any more comments so i'll just hand it back uh to michelle thanks Chris. oh we Shall received I? sorry uh we received 220 emails total and that was just kind of a, a about three different types of emails that we received one was for the anti-masking mandate that was through the county for some reason, uh, folks felt that they needed to let us be aware of their feelings on that. Um, we received 73 emails uh, regarding that. 
We received uh, 56 emails regarding the ordinance tonight specifically. A couple of those emails were also um, addressing the November 2nd hearing that we're going to be holding uh, regarding the phase one restrictions. So of the emails regarding tonight, there was 56 of those and 73% of those emails were for the um, in support of the ordinance to restrict gatherings for the Halloween weekend. For the phase one restrictions on November 1st, we received 91 comments. I did not um, break out approvals or supports or against on that one because I felt that we would be addressing that for Monday also. Great, thanks very much, Michelle. And just so the public's aware, we did receive emails of those public comments who may have been written into the public record and made available to the council prior to this meeting. Uh, thanks very much, Michelle and Chris. If there's nothing further, I am going to go ahead and close the public hearing on Ordinance 20-16 and turn it back to the council. I would prefer if we begin with a motion either for or against uh, passage of this ordinance. As a reminder, it does take two-thirds majority of the seated councilors, which are all present here tonight to pass this ordinance and we can deliberate uh, the pros and cons from there. Is there a motion? The motion, John, or Mayor? Rebecca. Okay, I'd like to make a motion to approve um, emergency ordinance 20-16. Thank you, Rebecca. Is there a second to the motion? I'll second it. Seconded by Councillor Quinnell. Rebecca, would you like to speak to your motion? Start with. Yeah, I um, I think with our numbers, um, we need to start enacting more, more restrictions going into the winter months. Um, as Tamley said, we're at a 13% positivity rate, meaning that's how many cases we have that are positive based on our population, but some people are saying that we're up to 20%. Um, and if we are consistently addressing what we can address, I do think we can get down to 5% or less, which would make our healthcare um, capacity much more manageable. And hopefully people wouldn't be developing long COVID or dying also. So I, I think we need to keep, um, keep on this as a council goal so that um, hopefully we'll be working with the Flathead County as well um, on these mitigation efforts in the future. But for now, since that doesn't seem available at this time, it allows us to put some parameters and prevent some spreading at this time. Thank you, Rebecca. I'm going to go through the list of councillors individually just to manage uh, your comments. Andy, do you have any comments on the motion? Yeah, and I'll try and keep my comments specific to the motion that's before us, and that's specifically for a Friday and Saturday night reduction of 50% on um, this coming Friday and Saturday for Halloween. Um, as opposed to looking forward to a week from now, because I think that's a whole different issue. Um, I think we all know what Halloween is like here. <laughs> I think it's, so, it's obviously a popular event, and I think it has the potential to be a super spreader event for sure. Um, I have a number of concerns supporting the motion. One is not everybody that puts a costume on, unfortunately, reads the newspaper, and I'm not sure that they're going to not show up anyway, and then they're going to show up, and there's going to only be half capacity in bars and restaurants and they're all going to be standing out in the street, which is not going to be a horribly manageable situation. I think that's probably a question a little bit for Bridger and um, for Bill. Um, so I would kind of ask that question if I could do that, Mr. Mayor. By all means, uh, Bridger, uh, Bill, any comments on Andy's question? I think you're muted, Chief Dow. Oh, we're unmuted now. 
Can you hear me now, John? Yes. Okay. Uh, it'd be much like we've done in the past, uh, you know, try to move people along. And, um, you know, as far as the social distancing and the masking, it would be pretty uh, difficult uh, to enforce. However, we will put forth every effort uh, to try to do that. Um, I think that um, if we get out as much uh, public notice as possible and have the bars and restaurants uh, post that at their their doors, and if we can get it on the media, that maybe that will help mitigate what we have to do. It's, it's going to be a daunting task um, if uh, we do have people who do show up and are not going to have places to go. Uh, we're going to have to deal with them, but we'll deal with them. We've dealt with them in the past. <clears throat> John, could I, could I add to that as well? Please. Um, so our crisis communications team is prepared should this ordinance pass this evening to get the message out um, because we do not want um, everybody showing up. Um, I did hear word from a retailer that the trick or treat street um, Central Avenue thing, the businesses really have talked about it and are not participating this year. They're not advertising that. Um, and I've also heard that the bars uh, really aren't talking about the costume contest, the bar hopping that um, also occurred in the past. So hopefully with the businesses not promoting it nearly as much and um, our messaging that will get out um, to the press, uh, we will get enough coverage to discourage individuals to show up um, in large capacities. Obviously there will still be services available, but the big party atmosphere will be gone. Great, thanks Dana. Andy, further comments or questions for that matter? Um, yeah, so I guess my further comment would be is, you know, like I said, I was probably inclined to not support this, but I think one thing that we have seen is a pretty overwhelming level of support from the community, um, not just in emails, but certainly for people I've talked to and certainly people we've heard from tonight. And I think that Halloween does present a, a clear and present danger to our community and the county as a whole. And I think that this is restrictive, but it's not overly restrictive. People are still going to be able to have their doors open. They're still going to be able to generate some revenue. And quite frankly, from what Dana just said and what she's hearing a little bit from businesses too, it might kind of be a favor to them a little bit to have the city get out ahead of it and say, hey, look, we need to be a little bit more careful here. And so I'm inclined to go ahead and support the motion. And other than that, I don't have any further comment. Great. Thanks, Andy. And I appreciate your comment, Andy, about uh, let's please stick to what's in front of us this evening. We're not here to talk about long-term November 1st public hearing, but simply the October 30 and 31 interim emergency ordinance. With that said, Frank, any comments this evening? You're muted, Frank. Finding the wrong buttons all the time. Uh, the I, I am also inclined to support this, but I am also very concerned about what people are referring to as further restrictions or shutdowns. That's not what this is about. Um, I would be as comfortable um, with staying with a uh, mandate that regulated these things instead of a 50% maybe 75% or what, or the maximum capacity, if it's less, where you could have social distancing. Um, I am very sensitive to not so much, um, I'm very sensitive to our, the burdens that are most of our downtown burden, our businesses have taken on um, and the restrictions in the following. Um, the reason for, at least in my, my view, what I've seen is, the reason for this ordinance is not because most of our businesses are not following it. It's those that are violating it consistently that won't get the, get the plan. And my concern is with enacting this, and I think we should do something to get, if nothing else, send the message, um, that it's those businesses that are killing um, other people's businesses. They are the ones that are responsible for this bloom in this outbreak. They are the ones that are ignoring the health guidance that they're getting um, nationally, locally, and otherwise. Um, and that frustrates me to no end um, that we have um, 
that because of those businesses, everybody else in town gets hammered, and that's just wrong. Um, and so I, I will support this, but I would also entertain um, reconfiguring the limitation on um, the maximum capacities from 50% to 75% or that which would, um, or what, no more than 75% or less, depending upon what social distancing would allow within a particular facility. Um, and with that, I would offer a uh, friendly amendment to the to this motion to, in fact, change that restriction from 50% to 75%. And if I get a second, I can, I've spoken to it. We do have an amendment on the table, which I'll take as a motion. Uh, we do need a second, which would basically amend the ordinance to read uh, or increase the capacity or occupancy to 75% or less, depending on a business's ability to socially uh, distance. Is there a second to that friendly amendment that was offered by Councillor Sweeney? I will second that. And the motion was seconded by Councillor uh, Davis. Frank, would you like to speak to your amendment before I ask Michelle to take roll call or ask for council comments? No, I think I've explained my position on it and, and why I think it's important. Um, I just, I feel like that if people will follow the rules as they've been laid out, if they will wear a mask, if they will socially distance, we can make this work and everybody will remain healthy. It's those that are not participating that are causing the problem. And I really, I appreciate Lauren's comments earlier that she is one of the rule followers and they're doing a great job and they're trying to make this thing work. Um, I want, I don't, I want to reward that and not um, punish it. Um, and so that's the reason as much as anything else for my motion. Thanks, Frank. Uh, further comments from the council or questions on Frank's friendly amendment? I have comments, John. Uh, Rebecca, and then I'll acknowledge Steve after. I will not be supporting this, Frank. Um, we're already at 75% and we're dealing with um, people partying and drinking and having fun. And so um, I would have preferred if we had closing at 8 p.m. with private parties. And I, I still feel like it's a high risk event with the numbers that we have in the valley at this time. We still have uh, Thanksgiving and Christmas and New Year's coming. And so I think we should go to stay at 50% for these two days. Um, and then, then it goes right back to 75% afterwards. But I did, I did appreciate Lauren's comment that some people are doing an excellent job consistently doing everything they can and, and losing revenue. And I, um, at some point, I think we should look at the fines that people that are not compliant are responsible for. But for this for this new motion, I'm not in support of um, of increasing the occupancy because I think it adds danger to the evenings. Thanks, Rebecca. Um, I have a question for Angie, uh, most likely. With Frank's motion, when I cross reference that to section two of the ordinance that reads no public or private gatherings larger than 10 individuals may be held unless it is possible to maintain six feet of social distance for those dates. Many of the businesses I speak to in the downtown, and there are many, indicate that in order, when they are at 50% capacity, that's about the highest capacity they can have given the footprint of their operations and the need to socially distance. So if we were to change the occupancy percentage to 50%, of course, it would be site specific as Frank indicated based on a business's you know, footprint, you know, ability to socially distance, but are we, are we kind of, are we in conflict with ourselves at that point in the ordinance? John, I don't think so because section number two is, is really not geared towards bars and restaurants. 
Um, that's really addressed in section four um, and and section three. Uh, section two is more geared towards um, Halloween parties, trick or treating, um, that sort of thing. So I don't think that we necessarily are in conflict if um, Frank's amended. Okay, thanks Angie. Any further comments from the council before roll call? Steve. Um, if, we, if we change this to 75 percent, uh, I'm not sure how this is different from what we already have in place. Um, what, what is substantially different other than that we're asking them to close an hour earlier? That's really, it seems like that's the only thing that we're, that's, that's a different difference from that. That's, that's, that's my interpretation as well, Steve, but I'll, I'll certainly defer to Angie's legal opinion. Sure, Steve, and, and I agree with you to a certain extent. It's not really different than anything that we're operating in under the governor, governor's mandate right now. Um, you know, the 50% in the statute or the ordinance as, as it exists is, is a hard number. It's not taking into account the ability to socially distance. Um, if you were to increase it to 75%, again, there would be a requirement of social distancing. I think that's that would be, well, I mean, the, I think that would be kind of hard to enforce, but um, I don't know that it's substantially different than the governor's um, directive that's still in effect. So. Thanks, Angie. Thanks, Angie. Anything further, Steve? Yeah, I just want to say I, I'm not going to support this amendment uh, primarily because this is not, you know, this is a one-off event. This is, this is not, people don't go in to sit down and have drinks on Halloween. They go to have a good time. They're standing around. They want to be standing at the bar. This is, this, we're trying to prevent something from getting worse. It's already out of hand in our county and we're trying to prevent it from getting worse. We're trying to prevent this from turning into a super spreader event. And by, by virtue, by not, by basically saying we're not really changing anything other than you have to close an hour early, I don't think we're getting down the road to preventing what we know this could possibly turn into. Thank you, Steve. Further comments on the friendly amendment? I was, uh, oh, excuse me. Um, I seconded this friendly amendment because I, I agree with some of the comments that were made that if a business is complying with all of the regulations that we have and all the regulations in here, you know, keeping social distancing, enforcement of, of all of that, I don't believe that that is necessarily where the crux of the problem is. I think a lot of, we've heard some good comments about a lot of businesses not complying. Um, and I think that's a problem. And I think that the, the problem with the ordinance in my mind is I draw a distinction between the bar that's packed to 75% at 10 o'clock at night versus, you know, the Buffalo who's trying to seat folks for an evening meal. And this, this does blankly apply to both. And so, you know, this is a tough call for me, but, um, you know, in my mind, it's not quite as much about the percentage um, as it is, you know, getting folks to comply with the regulations generally, um, and hence my support for the amendment. Thanks, Ben. Frank, did you have your hand up? I did. I, did, I just want to say uh, one thing, and I and I appreciate Steve's concern and, and Rebecca's um, and their position on this. Um, nothing in my motion would encourage in my view, uh, the return to crowds at, at bar rails or anything else. Um, I appreciate that and I, and I, so there are some differences uh, with respect to what I've proposed here with that 75%. It's a maximum as opposed to 50%, that's the difference. Um, it still would not uh, encourage or um, um, attendance at, like I said, crowded tables or at um or at, at bar at bar stools so i appreciate your position and i understand it and uh i know it will be it would be more difficult in some respects to enforce because it's more of a judgment judgment call but it's i just i find this uh it's hard with a one size fits all when we're hammering people 
or affecting people that have been following the rules of the road and they've been effective um, and penalizing them because some people haven't been and they've been causing the problems. And so that was the, the basis again for my motion and I appreciate uh, the consideration. Thank you. Um, kind of a question for Angie, but I think I'm answering my own question. I think one difference would be is that by passing the emergency ordinance that we have local enforcement control as where we don't currently really have that. We're reliant upon the county and we're reliant upon the state because there's state regulations and their county regulations, but we would actually have local enforcement ability at this point. Um, once the ordinance is passed, which we don't currently have. So I think I would be more inclined to support the 75% um, as a result of that. And I think Ben makes a compelling argument that for the people that are out there that are not bars, that aren't having a, a massive influx of partiers for a night, but are just trying to sell a hamburger for that night, um, it will be difficult for them. And Frank is right on the money when he says a one size fits all is not not an easy thing to do. And is my assumption correct, Angie? Yeah, Andy, it's absolutely correct. Um, we would be able to enforce it through civil um, infractions. We'd also theoretically be able to enforce it by yanking people's business licenses. And I think Frank makes a really good point that the ordinance, even if you were to increase the capacity 75%, if social dis distancing can be achieved, it still does prohibit people from standing at the bars, from standing at the counters, and it does require social distancing and that the tables be spaced and that there only be six people at the table. So if a business is big enough, you know, to, to accommodate those, I, I think it is different. And it does turn um, over control to us rather than us relying on somebody else to try to enforce what the government, basically what the governor has already mandated. So. Could I ask Angie a question to John? Uh, let me just check with Andy. Is anything oh, further? Andy? Uh, no, that's all. Thank you. Thank you, Rebecca. So Angie, initially under phase one, did we not have people at the bar um, at the counter? And then also the, the wait people had to go to a table to serve. Someone could not go up to the bar. Is that correct? That was correct, Rebecca. Yes, there was no standing at the bar, no standing at the counter, and um, your server would actually have to come to your table under phase one. And now under phase two, that's all eliminated, correct? That's correct. That's my understanding. Okay. But our health department um, person that's managing this um, was recommending that that would be um, much safer if we went back to the phase one standard where people did not congregate at the bar and that they um, were not sitting there for long periods of time in a situation like this where people will be drinking and um, once it once the capacity gets um, pretty crowded um, they don't move because they've been out a lot during these events so I think we're increasing the risk by staying at 75%. I just wanted to tell you that. Sure, Rebecca, in section six actually mirrors the phase one requirements where it says restaurants, bars, breweries, distillers, and casinos must prohibit individuals from sitting or standing at bars or counters. If you guys wanted to add to section six that um, the food and beverage must be served actually at the table, I think you could do that. Thank you, Angie. Angie, quick question for you. Under current state directives, are restaurants held, I know bars are, are restaurants held at 50% capacity or 75 presently? So there's 75, John. It's 75, okay. Further comments from the council on the friendly amendments? Yeah, Michelle, you want to talk? Question. Um, John, I'm sorry, just one okay. question. Angie, is it possible to um, to keep restaurants at their normal operating at 75% and then just to um, say bars and breweries are uh, these other high risk kind of more precautionary standards? 
I think you could do that, Rebecca. As far as breweries go, they close fairly early per state law anyway. So, I mean, I guess I'm not an expert, but I don't see breweries and distillers as, as a big risk on Halloween. Um, they close at eight, so. But it's up to you guys. I think you could set a different standard for restaurants if you wished. Um, you'd have to make some, you know, some findings with respect to why bars are more risky on these two days than restaurants or, you know, breweries or distillers or however you guys wanted to craft that. But it, I think once people are seated in a restaurant, the risk isn't as high. Um, and breweries closing early are not as high of a risk, but the bars are where people congregate very closely together. And then if it's really crowded, there's a lot of drinking, there's more higher risk of people uh, spreading the virus. So that's my concern. Rebecca, I would, I agree with you that bar settings, et cetera, are probably a much higher risk business than restaurants for the reasons you state. I think we're already going to be struggling if this passes tonight with the enforcement end of things and ask our men and women in uniform to enforce two different occupancy or capacity percentages based on whether they're a restaurant or a bar would add even more to their plate. And I, I think it's, I, I don't agree with that recommendation, even though you didn't put that as a formal amendment for that reason though, just because I think we're already gonna be struggling significantly with the enforcement end of this thing. So in my, from my perspective, I think we should leave the ordinance as written with a maximum occupancy of 50% for the reasons that you and Steve have both now stated now this evening related to the amendment. With that said, are there further comments on the friendly amendment? Yeah, John, I have a question. Um, and I don't, I don't know if this would be pertinent or, or if this would be allowable or not, but I know that uh, Lauren has a, a private party planned because she's doing what she can to, to be one of the rule followers. Um, and I don't, I don't know if 50% would affect her plan of that as in place and if we could ask for that or if that would be out of order, um, just as a frame of reference for what going from 50 to 75 would do to somebody who's taken a lot of steps to, to be a good player here. If we were in a live setting, Steve and Lauren was present in the audience and she rose her hand and you acknowledged her, we would allow her to approach the council. So in this case, if Lauren still on and you'd like to acknowledge Lauren, uh, by all means, uh, feel free to do so. Thanks, John. Uh, Lauren, I see your name is still in the participant list. If you're there, if you could raise your hand to answer that question, if that 50% would change what you're trying to do as one of the good players out there. Okay. Lauren, you like go ahead. Looks like she's not listening. Oh, oh no, I didn't know if I was unmuted or not. Yes, it would restrict the number of reservations that we currently have for that night. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. I appreciate your, your time. Thanks, Steve. Further comments from the council on the friendly amendment before I ask Michelle for a roll call. Not seeing any, Michelle, roll call, please. Councillor Davis? In favor. Councillor Sweeney? In favor. Councillor Hennon? In favor. Councillor Quinnell? In favor. Councillor Norton? Councillor Norton? Opposed? And Councillor Fury? In favor. And the motion does carry, which is a motion for the friendly amendment on a five to one vote with Councillor Norton voting in opposition with that friendly amendment added to ordinance 20-16. Uh, we will go back to the original motion, which was to approve ordinance 20 dash 16 in the emergency ordinance establishing restrictions upon businesses to help limit the spread of COVID-19 on October 30th and October 31st, 2020 only as amended. Are there further discussions to the original motion? 
Michelle, roll call, please. Uh, Ryan, I'm sorry, I saw your hand. Yeah, I just had some some uh, points that I wanted to make. I, you know, I think Lauren brought up some really important points about the businesses in Whitefish and how hard they are trying to comply with what seem to be ever changing guidelines and restrictions. Um, you know, and it's not lost on me when I look around. You know, there are a lot of businesses in town that are doing a really great job. I mean, just off the top of my head, I can think of, you know, Ed at the Tap House is doing great. Lauren's doing great. Ian at the Tea Kettle is doing great. Andy and Alex at the Buffalo are doing a great job. Um, you know, unfortunately, I think we just have, you know, a, a few businesses that, for whatever reason, feel like they don't have to follow the regulations, and they're paying the price now because the state has come down on them, um, and they're going to have to hire a lawyer and defend that in court. Um, you know, it's also not lost on me what, what Rhonda mentioned. I don't think there's any financial relief coming. And... It's a tough decision um, to sit here and think about all the people that work in the bars and restaurants and rely heavily on the tips that they're going to make um, and to think about people that might not be able to make rent, um, might not be able to put gas in their car. Um, and I'm, I'm not, I'm kind of thinking that the bars and the restaurants are a bit of a scapegoat here. Um, I mean, I haven't seen too much rock solid evidence that this is the real cause of the spread. Um, so I, I'm really torn about whether or not I, I can support this ordinance. Um, just thinking about bartenders and servers in this town that are gonna have to close up shop even earlier on a Friday and Saturday night when it's already the shoulder season, I mean, I, I guess that's really all I have to say. Um, uh, th I thank everyone for their comments. Um, the mayor's right. The mayor's correct. You know, I've read every single one of the of the emails that were sent to us. Um, just know that whatever way the council goes, um, we don't take these decisions lightly. Thank you, Ryan. Steve. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I just have. I have one question for Dana. Um, Dana, do you have any projections on the um, the tax revenue from the resort tax? You know, I haven't, I, we really have a tough time projecting future uh, revenues, but uh, we still see numbers that are down. Um, you know, retail is a little bit stronger than, um, than we expect, but our bars and restaurants and lodging do remain down. Do you have like a, ballpark estimate of how down they are for the summer right. months. Oh, let me see real quick. Pull it up. Oh, yeah, I'm just trying to wrap my head around this. Anecdotally, I'm hearing that every place is as busy as it's always been. Um, but we'll really bear that out is when we look at what our resort tax revenue is and what that compares to a normal year. Yep. Um, let me see. So it looks like when we look at our cash basis report, um, you know, the better one would be our quarterly report. Let me pull that up. Okay, so. When we look at actual, so we, we have two different ports for resort tax. We have our, our cash basis, which is when we collect funds, but we also do one um, that looks at um, collections as of the month. So obviously we haven't gone through many months, but you know, when we look back to um, June, we were definitely down 20% total collections. May was 29, April we were down 41%. So you can see like where we had our closures um, and, and to start it off, February, we were at 16% positive. These are all negatives that I just read off to you. So negative 26, negative 41, negative 29. As we've moved through the shoulder seasons, you know, June and July, we saw improvements. Um, you know, we, we got out of the 20s again. We we're back down to only being down 15%. 
Um, that being said, you know, when we look um, at the, the months coming forward, we had some collections from prior periods. So there was some, um, some positives over the last period in August, but you know, I don't know that that's going to hold. Our, our toughest season is the shoulder season. And, um, you know, I think, I think what you can assume is that we're going to be down, you know, that, that 20%, 15, 20% range, um, for all that's for all, all businesses, um, until we see a strong return of our tourism again, and, and businesses open hundred percent. Okay. Thank you. Um, the other question I have is about enforcement. So this enforcement is just going to come down to our police officers. Is that correct? For, for see, the challenge when it's a two day ordinance, you know, if this was a long-term ordinance, we'd have a complaint form and we would, we would create a process. Um, when you're talking two days, uh, you know, we will have our officers that will have to be active those two days. Obviously it's our, one of the busier weekends in the shoulder season. And so uh, we already plan to have additional officers on staff. Um, hopefully we don't see the numbers coming to town so that they have more time to, to focus on this enforcement. Um, but you can imagine if trick or treaters are out, we're still managing children with vehicles, um, but we will have our officers out. You know, they, they definitely uh, will, will shut down businesses should they not, you know, close um, at the time frame of when we set this, but one of the things, capacity is a challenge. Um, I think doing a walkthrough and checking to make sure that people are social distancing, that's that's a possibility. Um, you know, and, and, and it, it, I really do think that this is only gonna come down to a very few businesses, um, at most two or three, uh, that are gonna just blatantly, at least, you know, not comply uh, with the general sense of what you guys are passing. Um, if, if with the the amendment to state 75% capacity, if there's an issue today, that's an issue we can now address. But the two days that this is going to be in effect, um, you know, only we can only come up with so much processes, I guess. But our police will be our our uh, first means of enforcement. Um, if they have a complaint, we will process the um, municipal. You know, they they notice a an issue. They will be able to assist in issuing that municipal infraction, which would go through our court process for any penalties or fines to be determined by the judge. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, and John, if I might, I just have a couple of comments, and then I'll be done for the evening. Um, but I think it's unfortunate that we're not a little farther out in front of this than we are. We're talking about this doing this for the next something that's happening in five days from now um and which we could have given people a little bigger lead time uh so that we could get it really ahead of this thing because i think 50 percent is really where we need to be but i don't want to I, I don't think it's fair to people like lauren to make them change all the reservations that they have and try to figure out how they're going to do it or if they're just going to ignore it so uh that's why i voted for that amendment um because it, it, it we're too late in the game to really to restrict it that much. Um, and at the same time, I, I, I've said this before, this has been pushed into our laps and it's our turn to take leadership on this. And so we need to do something. I think this is about the minimum we can do. Um, and I, I think we need to be thinking about how we're gonna enforce this because that is the real issue here is how, no, no matter what we have, how do we enforce it? Um, and that's always been the issue. Uh, we don't have a lot of support from the county on the enforcement end of things. Um, with schools, it's pretty easy. If you don't wear your mask, you send the kids home. Parents come pick them up. Um, with businesses, we're relying on businesses to kick people out, knowing that they're down and they're hurting and, and they're struggling making ends meet. And that's uh, a little bit um, unfair, uh, although there are a number of businesses that are do, doing their best. And we were through so many of those comments from business owners who are trying hard to do the right thing. Uh, so I will be supporting this um, motion, this uh, ordinance tonight. And I hope that we can really have a robust discussion next week about what do we need to do to get on top of this thing? Because it's clear that we need to do something and we can't just sit back and watch because that's not, going to get us where we want to be. We have ski season coming up and that's, we got to, we have to pay attention to the things that, that are, are big money makers for our town. And if we 
if we don't get on top of it, we're not going to have those either. We're going to be continuing to talk about these things. Um, anyway, thank you. I will be supporting this ordinance tonight. Um, John, could I say one more thing? Uh, well, uh, let's go in order of the hands that are raised. I'm going to go to Chief Dial and to Ben, and then I'll circle back to you, Rebecca. Chief Dial. I think you're, you're you okay, now? Yes. Okay. Uh, I just wanted Bridger to comment on what our plans are as far as, uh, as, far as enforcement. So we're all on the same page. So uh, go ahead, Bridger. So as this being a, a city infraction, um, and, and we did do um, some walkthroughs over this weekend, and we do bar walkthroughs on a regular basis. Um, you know, I, I would foresee our in, in enforcement of these infractions is if, as we do our walkthroughs, our officers are equipped with body cameras, and uh, we would, once the officers saw an issue at an establishment, um, we would take that body footage and um, write up a report and, and send that off to legal um, to be prosecuted with an infraction. There's not much we could do other than request the, uh, obviously the bar owners aren't usually there, but the employees that are working that there's an issue and that a, a complaint will be filed with the city um, concerning the ordinance. Um, we did do some walkthroughs over the weekend. Um, there was two establishments that we found to have some issues. Um, they're mainly with employees, not, um, not patrons to the establishment. Uh, the officers saw just mainly just not wearing masks behind the bar and in, in, in those areas, whether they were taking a break from the mask or not, um, they felt it to be an issue. So um, that's what I would foresee that the rest of the establishments were following rules, offering masks, wearing masks, um, people were seated, those type of things. So it is, um, it's definitely not all the bars that are the issues. Thanks, Bridger. Ben. Yeah, thank you, Bridger. I appreciate those comments. Um, I would begin by by saying also thank you to the folks that submitted public comment. I know I spent quite a bit of time reading the emails before this meeting started, and I felt that there was some uh, very well articulated emails from some of the local business owners impacted by this, uh, largely in favor um, of the ordinance. And um, I think that that really helps uh, us inform our decision. And so I just wanted to, um, you know, say thanks for that. I, uh, you know, I continue to find myself extremely frustrated by the situation that we find ourselves in. I know the the statistics that we heard at the top of the meeting are are shocking, honestly, in terms of where we are. And I also think that the lack of action from the county health board and, frankly, every level of government above that um, is also shocking. And so, you know, here we are. But as I said in the previous meeting, I, I don't think sitting around and and letting this thing spread uncontrolled is the way to go. Um, you know, I think that the ordinance here before us uh, is a balanced way to deal with a, a really difficult weekend. I know I love Halloween. I love going out on Halloween, or I used to, um, but this isn't the year for it. And I hope that folks will be safe and thoughtful and that this will, will help to keep the weekend um, safe for everybody in the community. There were some interesting points I think brought up regarding enforcement and um, and I think in my mind uh, those are conversations I'd like to explore a little bit further next week um, as we discuss the more long-term plan. Uh, I do intend to support this ordinance. I think it's the right thing to do right now and, um, and uh, I hope everybody has a wonderful Halloween. Thank you. Thanks, Ben. And finally, Rebecca. So, um, I just want to remind people we we really should have a goal of trying to get the spread down as quickly as we possibly can and consistently have our COVID safety um, protocols in place in every business and schools and ways of interacting. Um, I was really glad to see how much the enforcement is now kind of delineated out so people know what to do to help with that. 
Um, and we do know that almost all of our businesses are doing a fantastic job. It's just a few that are kind of thwarting the rules. Um, but it is a health crisis. We are in a financial bind as well, but people don't get their health back or they die, you know, so, so we're all going to need to really, um, think about not, not, um, minimizing the effect on someone's health when they get COVID and the cost to our healthcare frontline people that are fighting for their lives. Um, so I just wanted to say that because we always seem to cycle back to the businesses and keeping our economy viable, but really it, it is about keeping our citizens alive and healthy and the frontline workers in our hospitals um, able to handle what's coming at us too. So sometimes down the road, we might need to make even more harsh decisions if we don't get this right quickly. Thanks, Rebecca. Before we take roll call, are there any further comments from the council? I guess I'll, I'll just chime in here. I, I, I keep increasing it back that it will help. I also know that some of our larger businesses in the downtown and all Reference the Great Northern Bar and Grill. Scott basically indicated with social distancing measures in place and other PPE measures, he basically is right at 50% capacity. And that's about all he can do given the other uh, requirements uh, from the state directives. So while I somewhat see this as more or less window dressing at this point and that it's been weakened significantly in reality, I just want the council to know that basically we're gaining one hour of closure time, 1130 no standing at bars and no more than six at a table and no large group settings. And, and that's, that's significant. Uh, but again, when we're asking our enforcement wing, which is our police department to, to do the heavy lift on this on very short notice, I, I, I question how effective this will really be. And those are my comments this evening. With that said, um, Michelle, roll call please. Councillor Davis. In favor. Councillor Sweeney. In favor. Councillor Hinden. Opposed. Councillor Quinnell. In favor. Councillor Norton. Favor. And Councillor Fury. In favor. Thank you, Michelle, and thank you, Council. The motion does carry on a five to one vote with Councillor Hemmen voting in oppor uh, opposition. Excuse me. I'd just like to thank the audience for attending tonight. And Tom Lee, you know, your time was very appreciated, and I hope we can have you back here for another update in the in the near term. Your your busy schedule, of course, uh, dictating when we can get you again. Did you have a comment? I do. Um I hear a lot of frustration and that there are businesses who are doing what they're doing what they're supposed to do. They're following the rules and there's some bad actors out there that are basically kind of ruining it for others. So I would encourage you to uh, uh, make those comments known to the county attorney um, that that's, you know, we have the complaint system, we have the process, and if that process is followed, the bad actors are the ones who um, will pay the price, not the ones who are following the rules. Thanks, Tamily. I appreciate that, that feedback and something we'll certainly uh, consider at our meeting on Monday night. Um, thanks, everyone. I just wanted to see a, real quickly, do counselors have uh, comments this evening? Are they lengthy because if they are going to be lengthy, I'm going to call for a five, five to 10 minute recess before we move to item three of the agenda. Keep in mind, we do have a regular scheduled meeting next Monday, which would be November 2nd, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and I'm sure there'll be opportunity then once the agenda is posted 
uh, to have more lengthy discussion regarding uh, our COVID response in a, in a broader sense. Uh, just real briefly, are you folks planning on extended comments this evening? You can just shake your head or say yes. I'm not seeing that it's going to be extensive, so we'll move on to item three and we'll start this evening uh, with Andy. Uh, Councillor Fury, any comments this evening? Uh, none. Was that no? Uh, yes, no. No comment. Okay. Thanks, Frank. Uh, Councillor Sweeney. Nothing additional at this time. Thanks. Thanks, Frank. Uh, Councillor Davis. No further comment. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. Uh, Councillor Norton. Just wanted to say thank you guys for um, tolerating me pushing these items. You know, when you work in healthcare, you get nervous about healthcare issues. So thanks for um, growing through this pandemic as I keep being the squeaky wheel. Thanks, Rebecca. Uh, Councillor Hennon. Nothing for me, Mr. Mayor. Thanks very much, Ryan. And finally, Councillor Quinnell. I just want to say thank you for all those who attended um, and thank you in advance, Bridger and uh, Chief Dial for taking this on this weekend. Really appreciate it. Thanks, Steve. I don't have anything further with the exception to Dana's point earlier. We will be issuing a public service announcement sometime tomorrow afternoon uh, regarding the council's decision this evening. And we've also put together a community letter that will be distributed I believe it already has or will be over the next couple of days in person from our city staff to our local uh, businesses, informing them of not only uh, the direction that you provided this evening, but also encouraging voluntary compliance through uh, consideration of, of some phase one directives of which we will again uh, discuss at our uh, meeting on Monday night. And I wanted to thank Dana and our entire crisis communications team, including uh, LJ Communications for their hard and diligent work over the last you know couple of weeks as we as we've navigated these changing times. So a big thanks to those uh, on the crisis management team and also to the council, of course. Dana, I'll turn it back to you. Anything further before we adjourn? Thank you, um, John. I just want to get uh, some clarification on Monday's meeting about what you want in the packet for your consideration. So um, generally, we typically have an ordinance or something that you'd like to consider. Um, do you want us to just put in the phase one guidelines from the governor? Um, obviously, we have public testimony that we'll include as well. Um, but is there any documentation you'd like us to provide to um, to to start that process, I guess, for the packet? You know, I'll, I'll chime in here. I spoke with uh, Bridger over the weekend and uh, Chief Dial today, and I think there's more information that we need as a council in order to inform our decision making on Monday night. I, for one, have become a little bit confused as to what our abilities are as a city when it comes to placing additional restrictions on bars, restaurants, business above and beyond what uh, comes down from both the county and the governor. Um, and maybe I'm alone in that, but I, I still feel like it's a bit gray to me what our charter powers allow us and don't allow us to do. So I think a staff report uh, describing that would be very helpful for the council, at least myself, not speaking for the council. And I also feel, speaking with Bridger and Bill, that we really need to look at the enforcement end of things if we're going to consider going back or implementing some of the phase one uh, directive it has to be enforceable. Um, I'm not a fan of legislating just for the sake of legislating and it has to be meaningful at the end of the day and really target what our main purpose here is and that's to protect the public safety of our citizens and residents alike as well as tourists. So that's, that's what I would like to see for Monday. I don't think it needs to be an exhaustive uh, research project for Angie and staff, but um, a, a, a short, succinct cliff note version uh, that could come in the form of a brief staff report. Uh, that's, that's my um, feedback to you, Dana, and I'll turn it to the council. Are you looking for anything additional beyond what I've um, articulated this evening? I'm not seeing any, Dana. 
Yep, nope, that is definitely helpful. And I think from an enforcement standpoint, obviously it looks different for a longer term uh, solution. I, I would say that when we had our mask ordinance, I felt that our process was um, was effective and we did walkthroughs and we had a complaint system and uh, we had businesses comply after after um, finding violations. And so, um, you know, I think that that's a process that I would encourage the council to consider like we did before. Um, Obviously, on a Friday, Saturday night, the complaints are going to come in after the fact. So there's, you know, the 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 only way to confirm that a violation is occurring is is with the uh, body cam footage. So it's not to say that businesses that violate it Friday and Saturday are not going to get a municipal infraction issued come Monday. Um, I think that that's something they should be aware of. And um, so I do think that that it is enforceable. Um, it just won't be a complaint based. Uh, it, it, it's just the complaint complaint based. Uh, process of what we used for the mask ordinance uh, would not be applicable applicable for this two day ordinance that you guys just passed. So um, for a longer term ordinance, so I think it would help relieve our police department who are focusing on uh, what I can only say are probably civil civil unrest coming election time and and the challenges we face with protests and whatnot. So, um, but we will provide that information for the council's consideration. Okay, thanks very much, Dana. Anything further from staff? Nope. Thank you, everyone. John, I just had one question. Um, I was looking at whether or not we needed to just uh, research fines for mask, like reestablishing our own mask ordinance and then establishing a fine um, for not wearing them to increase compliance within Whitefish. And I was just wondering if the staff could also look at that. There's a model that I sent out from Philadelphia one neighborhood was doing that. Um, uh, just, I, I feel like we need sort of a plan for the winter to decrease our spread, but also have the metrics in place so that we know what we're doing. Um, and also that the public knows what we're gonna implement if we get worse. So I think that that would help to have sort of like a phased plan like we started with but I agree with you, we don't know exactly what we get to do as a city versus the county versus the governor and enforcement is a big piece of it. So thank you. I'll, I'll comment briefly on that. And certainly if that's your desire, something that staff can look into. I've never felt that we should look at non-masking uh, punitively. And I don't think it's realistic for our police officers who we have two full-time officers on staff, maybe three for any given 24-hour period. They're working 12-hour uh, shifts when their time does come for some time off. It's desperately needed. So increasing staffing is going to be a challenge if we want to go to a ticketing um, form. And I also feel that the work we're doing over the next two weeks to encourage voluntary compliance from our businesses is very important. And I still hang my hat on the fact that we can accomplish a lot and get people on board to help us, you know, have, have businesses help the city, you know, keep the spread down. And I still remain optimistic that through voluntary encouragement, we're going to get there. When we look back on the lodging restrictions that we imposed, we literally only gave lodging facilities, I think three or four days to voluntarily comply before we legislated the ordinance. And I believe at that time we had close to 70% uh, voluntary compliance from our lodging establishment. So I rest, I ho hold hope that we will see a similar response from our businesses because I think most, if not all of our business owners are very well invested in this community and want to do the right thing with some education and outreach and pulling people together. I'm hoping we can get there on a voluntary basis um, in short order. With that said, thanks everyone tonight for your time and we are adjourned.